Harry Potter is a multimedia franchise originally conceived by author J.K. Rowling as a series of seven novels. It has since grown into a string of successful films, toys, play sets, theme parks, a horrible play, and even candy. Yeah, there's actual Harry Potter candy, which is surprisingly okay? So getting this one out of the way right now, Harry Potter is very important to me. I was right in the Target demo when the first film was released and I ate it all up. Movies, I'm there at midnight. Books, I read them all and was also there at midnight. Merchandise, I bought too much of it. In fact, I still wear clothes with Harry Potter iconography on it. I also eagerly awaited my owl to arrive on my 11th birthday so that I could go off and learn magic at Hogwarts, as there was no lore to learn about the American Magical School of Ilvermorny, only to be terribly disappointed when it was irreversibly confirmed that I am, in fact, a muggle. I drank the butterbeer-flavored Kool-Aid, man. I was in, I was there. Oh, and by the way, the butterbeer at Harry Potter World in Orlando is amazing? The point of all of this is to say that I understand that Harry Potter and his wizarding world are integral parts of a lot of people's lives and childhoods, and the different stories told across its multitudes of installments and their adaptations could mean very different things to their viewers. Maybe the Sorcerer's Stone stands out to you because you were 11 when you discovered the series and were perfectly aligned to follow Harry as he grew up with you. Maybe the Order of the Phoenix is your jam because you had rough teenage years, and having someone like Harry go through that with you was comforting. Maybe the Prisoner of Azkaban film is your least favorite because it cut plot from the books, sacrificing its accuracy as an adaptation to make it into what I would argue is a better film. All of these opinions are okay, and I stress this because I want you to know that I understand that. But what lies within these walls are the reasons why Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban is my favorite entry in the series. And I mean that all-encompassingly. The book is my favorite Harry Potter novel, the movie is my favorite Harry Potter film, I haven't played the game, but I assume it's slightly less awful than all the rest, though that might just be my bias speaking, I haven't done any research into that. But this does now beg the question, why? Well, it's for a couple of reasons, allow me to explain, starting from the film and growing outwards into the larger themes baked into the narrative of the novel. After the release of the first two movies, director Chris Columbus, who had originally intended to direct the adaptations of all seven novels, realized that in doing so, he would be sacrificing his presence in the lives of his own children to shepherd Harry and his friends through their own childhoods. So he stepped aside, and Mexican director Alfonso Cuaron was offered the director's chair as his replacement. This decision by Warner Brothers was maybe the smartest one I think they could have possibly made in this situation. Don't misunderstand. Columbus did the best job we could have asked for, establishing the Harry Potter universe's look on film, truly transferring the essence of what was of the first two books onto the silver screen. Part of me regrets that we'll never see what his vision for the rest of the franchise would have been. I imagine it would have walked a very different, more colorful path, to say the least. But Columbus did not direct these films, and Warner Brothers instead took a risk on a largely unknown and untested auteur. That, I feel, is one of the reasons The Prisoner of Azkaban works so well as a film. Sure, there's not a doubt in my brain that the producers and executives at Warner Brothers passed almost all of Cuaron's major decisions through committee after committee, and the fact that we got a film that was so different than Columbus's releases is a testament to how strong Cuaron's vision is. Imagine what insanity we could have gotten if there hadn't been people there to tell him no. But what exactly was done that was so different? I mean, firstly, and perhaps most obviously, is just how differently this movie was constructed as, well, a movie. Cuaron is a director who is known for his beautifully intentional yet free use of the camera and everything that is captured within it. Analyzing the little details of how he constructs scenes to draw focus from a large group down to a single character or conversation could be and has been the subject of entire essays about the Prisoner of Azkaban on their own. Odd and off-the-wall characters come in and out of frame, giving us snippets of lives we will never know anything about, unless Warner Brothers goes off the deep end and gives us a spin-off about Guy reading Stephen Hawking while moving Spoon in coffee or Maid who gets yelled at, which at this point is not entirely unrealistic. And the fact that we are shown these frankly weird people is beyond cool because it both expands the universe in unspoken ways and lets us know that there is danger in this world. Not everything is as safe or as cozy as they seem at Hogwarts, where even the danger from Harry's first two years seemed somewhat more innocent and juvenile. That is perhaps the most common new element in this film. Quaron's interpretation of the wizarding world is one with a grit and realism that allows us to see this fantastical world through a somewhat more realistic lens. 
Gone were the immaculate costumes worn by the children, perfect down to their every stitch and thread, instead replaced with individualistic wardrobes and uniforms that felt hastily cobbled together in a rush to get to class on time. A much more realistic representation of what happens in a school with a strict dress code, I can say with first-hand confidence. This was also reflected in the choice made to desaturate the world, to take away the obvious warmth and orange glow omnipresent in the franchise's previous chapters. Again, a view of what Scotland looks like that is much closer to reality. Every witch and wizard was also given their own uniquely designed wand, which afforded prop designers the opportunity to further characterize the people in the world by showing what sort of wand would choose each and every one of them, while simultaneously giving Warner Brothers an avenue to exploit collectors who really want all of those wands from Harry Potter world. Like me. These choices were intelligent and fit brilliantly with the thematic path the series traveled beginning with this very entry. The Prisoner of Azkaban was very much the point where, at least looking from Harry's perspective, Hogwarts and all of its mystical inhabitants were normalized. And that is true of the audience as well. This was not our first rodeo. Not only that, but Azkaban really cemented the idea that people aren't always what they appear to be or what people think of them. Something that was touched on with Lockhart and Quirrell in previous entries and expanded later on with characters like Dumbledore. I mean, three of the film's central characters, including the titular one, were literally built on this as a foundation. And one of my favorite moments in the film that showcases this happens here with Snape, where he shields Harry, Ron, and Hermione from the lycanthropic Lupin. Such a subtle detail that would seem out of character the uninformed. It had to have been added by the actor. And really, this, the comprehension that people are human beings with identities and histories and memories and families and hopes, dreams, goals outside of the purviews of others who only see them from one angle, that they are not simply a collection of thoughts that you have about them, that is a lesson that you oftentimes learn the hard way as a teenager. One of the most brilliant moves I feel J.K. Rowling made with her characters was to allow them to grow up, and realistically so with the audience she was writing for. She doesn't shy away from letting Harry make these mistakes, and The Prisoner of Azkaban was undoubtedly the first of her novels to really dive into this. Introducing elements from the past and using them as a conduit for Harry to deal with the beginnings of that teenage angst that all of us go through. One of the Harry Potter franchise's core tenets is that it's a story about growing up and accepting who you are. Accepting who the people around you are, and that begins here with The Prisoner of Azkaban, and that is why I love it. Now let's step back for a second to a thing I said just now while waxing poetic about this brilliant novel and its adaptation, The Past. The Prisoner of Azkaban introduces a lot of elements of this universe steeped purely in the past. That has always been somewhat of an obsession of mine, especially what we would call the recent past. The last hundred years or so. So much of this time has been so well documented, whether through official and standardized means or canonized folk tales, through more personal manners like memories or private pictures or familial stories. The idea that there is so much that we individually do not know about those who came before us, even though it is impossible not to come across that information because it is laid out everywhere, that we can look at old and forgotten photographs and get a vertical slice of a person's life, but tragically never know the how or the why it was taken, I eat that up. And it's also why my favorite scenes in this movie are those quiet moments, where characters are just sharing gorgeously intimate moments, passing on their knowledge and their experience, and most importantly, their memories of those that came before. We're about to get very, very personal here, but that is what cinches The Prisoner of Azkaban as my favorite Harry Potter story, specifically the characters Remus Lupin and Sirius Black and what they mean to Harry. The idea of family is something important, people who love unconditionally and will always be there because something in their soul would haunt them for the rest of their days if they were not. And that is something that Harry discovers throughout the series, what it means to have people who give a damn and who are worth giving a damn about. And blood does not factor into this one iota. Affection transcends such arbitrary limitations. Sirius and Remus, and Hagrid and Hermione and the Weasleys, for that matter, are as much Harry's family as his parents were because of the love that they all share. I'd argue that this idea of care and closeness is basically one of the other franchise's core themes. The people who end up on the winning side of the great war between the abstract concepts of good and evil are the people who let their love for others guide them, even many of the characters who are unarguably antagonists. But what makes Remus and Sirius stand out amongst all of the people who love and respect a protagonist unconditionally simply because they are surrogate family 
is that connection that they have to Harry's past. At least that is what makes it stand out to me. They are the ones who give Harry, and the audience by extension, a peek into parts of who he really is, where he comes from, and what could have been. They come into Harry's life at a time when he really needed them, to offer him guidance in ways that only the Weasleys had come close to giving, and a perspective on those who loved him the most in ways that no one else could. As someone who grew up in a non-traditional and complicated familial situation, I won't lie, the guidance is something that as a 13-year-old blaming himself for the actions of others and things he had no control over, I'd wish I'd had. I think that the soul of this story, of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, is that when you find those who deserve to be called your family, it doesn't matter what disease ails you, who you are, what you're from, how much money you have, where you are in your life, what the world thinks you've done in your past, and what they expect you to do in your future. Those are the people who will be with you for the rest of your life and beyond. That is what lies beneath this masterful introduction of mature themes, the excellent writing and breathtaking twists, the film adaptation made by an auteur and his army of craftsmen, and why I think it's the best.